I'm going to read our passage this morning. It's found in the book of Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 23. And it reads thus. Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes on in great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belonged to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Well, we had been studying the book of Colossians before our winter break, before our Christmas series on the person of Christ, who is the God-man, fully God and fully man. And so we had took a break from Colossians. We'd gone through chapter 1 and most of chapter 2, and I had promised that in the new year we would pick up and finish the rest of the book, and so here we are. And this morning we're talking about new life in the reality of Christ. And if you recall from before, I know it was a while ago now, but back in November, the last sermon we were looking at, we were talking about rules, the rules of the Christian life. And we had talked about then how the Christian life has many rules. Often when we become new Christians, we may even be shocked and surprised how, how many rules they are. Don't do this, do that, don't do that thing over there, but do this, and make sure you're doing this. There's so many rules we have to learn, it seems. So that's what we've been talking about in the book of Colossians lately. And in fact, that's how the world views Christianity. It views Christianity as a religion with so many do's and don'ts. You can do this, but don't you do that. You can't do this, or that, or this, and don't you dare do that other thing, but this thing over there is okay. So the Christian life is seen by the world as a list of duties to fulfill. And if you don't do your list, you're not going to go to heaven. So you better be doing that list of rules and responsibilities and duties in order to go to heaven. And the problem is that many Christians also view the Christian life in this same way. I just need to keep doing all the rules so that I will be a good Christian. But this is not at all what the Bible teaches. This is the essence of what we're talking about here today in the second chapter of the book of Colossians. Because if you are depending upon how well you're keeping the rules to enter into heaven, then I have some bad news for you this morning. That's not where you're going to go. Because if you are depending upon your own efforts to keep the rules, if you're depending on your own uh, efforts, then you're not depending upon God's grace expressed through the precious blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross. If you're trusting in yourself, then you're not trusting in Jesus. And it's only by trusting in the Son of God, in His death, and in His resurrection, that is the only way to receive salvation from the wrath of a holy God. And so if we begin with all of those rules that we have to keep, then we're actually starting in the wrong place. But we ask, are there rules in the New Testament that the Lord expects us to follow? There sure are, and there's a lot of them. But the point that we must always keep in mind that is that if we are just keeping the rules for their own sake, just for the sake of keeping those rules, then we're actually missing the point of the Christian life and the point of our daily walk with the Lord. And if you recall from last time, back in November, when we were talking about this earlier, 
The proper starting place is not with the rules. The proper starting place is to realize, first of all, my identity in Christ, who I am in Christ. That must come first. And so I am not trying to become someone in Christ. I actually realize that I already am someone in Christ. Who am I in Christ? Well, in Christ, I am already a perfectly righteous child of God. And this perfect righteousness comes not from me, but from Christ, who has given me his righteousness upon me to wear in the presence of God. Again, this is not my own righteousness, for mine could never be good enough. Mine could never even come close. Instead, I trust completely in Christ alone for the salvation of my soul. And so this is who I am. This is my identity in Christ. And when I recognize who I am in Christ as a child of God who is pleasing in His sight, then, then this ought to create within me a heartfelt desire for holiness. Because I know that my Heavenly Father is holy. And so therefore, as His beloved child, I should also desire to be holy as well. And holiness means that I am seeking the face of my Heavenly Father in everything that I do. Seeking to know what pleases Him and what displeases Him through the study of His Holy Word. Seeking to conform my character to His character. Seeking to align my way of thinking to His way of thinking. And then, only then, once holiness has become my focus and my desire... That is when I seek to keep the rules that are revealed in Scripture. And this order cannot be changed, and it cannot be reversed. It must only flow in this one direction. I am a child of God. My identity comes first. Therefore, I seek to imitate my Father in holiness. Therefore, I keep the rules He has revealed. If we reverse that order, if we put the rules first... That's when the Christian life becomes dull and lifeless and it becomes a hamster's wheel of religion. If I'm starting with the rules, then what am I going to be doing as a child of God? Well, I will be presenting my report card to the Father in order to gain His approval. And so then my sense of being His child will become dependent upon my ability to keep his rules. What will happen then? Well, this will only then give me a shaky and uncertain sense that I'm his child. Am I really his child? I only got a C minus, that last report card, so maybe I'm not his child anymore. Maybe he's going to disown me. Oh, I got an A minus this time, so I'm sure his child, I know it. Oh, that was a D. Oh, I'm really shaky. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if I'm going to be his child tomorrow. You see how when we put the rules first, our confidence in our, our adoption begins to lose its foundation. I don't really know if I'm God's child or not, or I don't know if I will be tomorrow. And then what happens? Well, then... Really, my desire to be holy begins to break down. I don't have a desire anymore to be holy. And then, eventually, I will even begin to despise the rules that I'm attempting to follow. This is not based on love. It's based on fear. I'm going to say, why am I following these rules anyway? If I have no fear of the Lord, no reverential fear, no loving fear, if it's only a repulsive fear, then eventually I'm going to hate these rules. Following the rules must come out of the desire of holiness, which must come out of recognition of who I am as a child of God, that I love Him, that nothing can take me away from being His child. And so maybe you are feeling that your desire for holiness has become dry or withered lately. That when you're really honest with yourself, you don't really care all that much about seeking the face of God. 
Or maybe you've begun to question if you really are a child of God because you just can't keep, seem to keep some of those rules. If this is the case with you, go back and examine which order of things you are following and then straighten it out. Spend quality time meditating on the gospel and rejoicing in your adoption as a child of God in Christ Jesus. And you know what? When you take the time to do that, a real desire for holiness will begin to bubble up and to well up in your heart that renews your desire to please your Heavenly Father. And really this is what we see going on in the book of Colossians this morning. Up until this point in the book, we've not really seen the situation that has been going on in Colossae. I've told you about it. I've told you that there is this false teacher with a kind of charismatic personality who's infiltrated this church and he is, he's been causing trouble there through his false teachings. But we haven't really seen that up until this point. And, and finally it's here in this passage that we're studying this morning that we get a kind of behind the scenes look into what was going on, why Paul had to write this letter to this church of Colossae in the first place, to correct the believers and to keep them focused on the main thing. And so this morning, we're going to zero in on this situation in the church in Colossae where this false teacher was causing this trouble. And we've said that there were two main areas that this teacher was spreading confusion in among these believers. And the two main areas of confusion were this. Who Jesus Christ is as the Son of God and what the Gospel is. Those are actually the two main pillars of the Christian faith. And so this is a big problem. This is why Paul has had to write this letter. Who Jesus is and what the Gospel is and why it matters. Because when those two things are thrown into confusion... Your entire Christian life will be thrown into confusion. And that's what was going on here in Colossae. And in fact, the, this false teacher in Colossae was presenting what seemed like a more exciting gospel. And in doing so, in order to do that, he was downplaying the significance or the importance of who Jesus was. I doubt that he was getting rid of Christ completely. Otherwise, I think that teacher would have been sent packing immediately. But instead, in all likelihood, he was displacing Christ from the center of their focus. That is, he was pushing Christ to the side. He was pushing Christ in the, to the side in order to emphasize his own visions of heaven. In effect, he was saying to the Colossian believers, he was saying this, you know, Christ is good and all. But I have a more direct access into heaven. Listen to me. Listen to what I have seen and I have heard. Listen to the dreams that I've had and the visions I've seen of the heavenly glory. Listen to me. And so you will understand the true path to pleasing God. Because by the way, God is pleased when you keep the Sabbath. And the important holy days. He is pleased when you keep the dietary rules found in the law of Moses. He is pleased when you get circumcised. He is pleased when you touch no unclean thing. And you follow the rules of cleansing and purification in a perfect way. And that's an enticing gospel. It's a false gospel. Because Jesus isn't at the center of it. This false teacher is is combining his ecstatic visions of heaven with, a, with a, a legalistic Jewish viewpoint of the law. And that can be attractive to these new believers in Christ. And so we see how Christ is downplayed, or he's pushed to the side, and a new way or a different way of salvation is being presented here. So this morning we're going to look at how the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, responds to this false teacher in the church of Colossae. And three times we see Paul pointing to Christ in our passage. 
And so we see how Paul is bringing the Colossians, he's bringing them back to the focus on the centrality of Christ. Christ cannot be downplayed, he cannot be pushed to the periphery, he must be right there in the center at all times. In essence, Paul is teaching the Colossians once again what the true source of holiness is. Holy living is not found in our attempts or our efforts to keep the rules. Instead, Paul is saying here, holiness flows out of how we view Christ and how we view ourselves in relationship to Him. And so today, when we are faced with questions of holiness and with judgments about what rules to follow, we must remember three main things. First of all, the reality is found in Christ. That's what we see in our passage. And secondly, we must keep connection with our head. And thirdly, we must remember that we have died with Christ to the elements of this world. And so let's look at that first point. The reality is found in Christ. The first two verses of our passage, it says this in verse 16. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So Paul is talking about shadows and realities. All of the things found in verse 16 are related to the law of Moses. And these things can still cause disputes to this day. When it says here, not to let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, some Christians read that and think, hooray! This means I can go home and have a beer with lunch. But that's missing the point. Because in this context, it is referring to religious eating and religious drinking, particularly with reference to the kosher dietary laws found in the Old Testament. Now, the Bible does not prohibit Christians from having a beer with lunch. But this is just focusing and nitpicking on the rules. And Paul is actually calling our attention elsewhere. That first and foremost, we are to look to the reality of Christ and not to the shadows that prefigured him. The book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 1, says something very similar to this. It says there, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming not the realities themselves. So the law is a shadow. The realities are coming, or have come. I don't know about you, but there's some times where I get fascinated with really simple things. I remember once I was filled with wonder over the mystery of electricity, and I gazed at a light bulb and a light switch for about five minutes as I turned it on and off and wondered, marveling that the light bulb came on every single time. Another time, I, I was transfixed by my shadow. I was, I was amazed at how my shadow was made by the light of the sun. And I was thinking about how wonderful it was to have this projection, this shadow, always following my every movement. But if we think about this for a moment, if, if I hold up my hand and, and I look at the shadow that's cast by my hand, what is the difference between my, my shadow hand, which is, which is on my paper in front of me, and the real hand? Well, I, I realize pretty quickly that there's no real comparison between the two. Between the reality of my hand and the shadow behind it, there's no comparison. My hand is, is totally real and my shadow is totally unreal. It's not as though they're even somewhat close or, or a little bit similar. The difference is so great, so vast. I can use my hand to do many things. I can pick up a pencil. I can wave it around and, and pick up other things. I can use my shadow hand for virtually nothing, except maybe making shadow puppets. And even those are being caused by my real hand. Imagine trying to pick up a pencil with a shadow. You can't do that. And this is the same comparison that Paul is making between the rules coming from the law as a shadow of the reality of Christ Jesus. 
In comparison to the glory of Christ, everything else becomes mere shadows. So when we are considering how to live our lives in holiness, we ought to put forward as our first concern whether or not we are doing what we are doing reflects the reality of Christ. Otherwise, we're just getting bogged down by the shadows, getting tangled up in the shadowy things. Here Paul is calling us to cut through the shadows and to fix our eyes on the reality who is Christ Jesus. Walking in the reality of Christ is another way of saying to walk in the light of Christ. 1 John 1, 7 says, If we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son purifies us from all sin. When we are walking in the light of God, in the reality of Christ, you know what begins to happen? It becomes easier and easier to recognize shadows. The more we're walking in the reality of the light of Christ, it becomes easier to recognize what a shadow is. That's what Paul is challenging the Colossian believers to do. Recognize that what this guy is telling you are mere shadows. He's taking you away from the reality. He's getting you tangled up in shadowy things. Stop doing that. This is what had begun to happen in the church in Colossae. The believers had begun to be seduced by shadows when they took their focus off the reality of Christ. And this is why, remember back in chapter 1, this is why the Apostle Paul described the Lord Jesus Christ in such glorious terms there. To remind the Colossians of the beautiful reality of who Jesus is, who Christ is. So that by comparison, everything else becomes ugly shadow. And this is why in the Christian life, whenever we follow the rules just for the sake of following them, separated from our love for Christ, then we begin to deal in shadows. We find ourselves walking through shadowy valleys. We've lost sight of Christ. But when we flip it around and we first focus on the reality of Christ, Chief, chiefly and foremost, then we will be able to follow the rules of the Christian life rightly and purely. Our second point this morning is that not only do we need to focus on the reality of Christ, but we need to stay connected with Him, for we are His body and He is the head. Look at verse 18 with me now. 18 and 19 say this, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. So Paul is saying here, that whenever someone begins to put Christ to the side, where Christ is no longer the center and the focus, whenever Christ gets put to the side, that person is then losing connection with the source of his spiritual life. As the head of the body, Christ is the source of growth and nourishment, as well as the body's reason, the whole reason for unity in the first place. It is only in connection with him that we can hope to grow in our relationship with God. And in verse 18, the fruit of this connection is, is described, or the fruit of this disconnection, I should say, is described. What happens when you become disconnected from the source of growth? Well, false humility happens. Grand heavenly visions. An unspiritual mind, it says, come puffed up with idle notions. Paul even says here that these things can disqualify us for the prize. Does Paul mean here that we can lose our salvation? No, I think what Paul is saying here is that such people who are disconnected were really never connected properly to begin with. 
And so Paul is emphasizing how important it is for us to stay focused and centered on Christ. We must remain connected with our head, the Lord Jesus. There are many preachers and teachers out there who seem to be beginning to lose connection with the head. And so verse 18 could describe so many so-called Bible teachers today, especially on television, teachers who are more interested in promoting themselves and their heavenly visions and their idle notions than promoting Christ. And we must always be using our discernment to recognize such false teachers by remaining connected to our head and by walking daily and deeply in his word. Paul almost seems to be using here the image of a man who has no head. Just as a headless man does not have any life in himself, let alone being able to grow, so a man separated from his spiritual head cannot have spiritual life in himself and cannot grow. We can only grow spiritually by remaining connected to Christ as the only reality that matters. Everything else by comparison is shadows and walking around headless. Our third point this morning is that we have died with Christ to the elements of the world or the, the basic principles of this world. We've died with Christ. So not only do we keep Christ as our reality at the center, not only do we keep Christ as the head that nourishes our spiritual growth, but we also recognize that we are new creations in Christ, raised to new life in Him, such that we have died to the elements of this world. Look at verse 20 with me. It says, Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not taste, do not touch, do not handle. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Well, this goes right along with realizing who we are in Christ as children of God. We are not trying to live with Christ. We are not attempting to die with Christ. We're already alive in Him. We have already died with Him. We are in His new reality. Therefore, we have left the land of shadows with its shadowy elements and its basic principles. We no longer belong to this world. We are in the world, but not of it. Instead, we are citizens of the heavenly city. Therefore, all of these old rules that fell under the old covenant do not apply in the new covenant, especially those rules that are based on human commands and teachings. Verses 22 to 23, Paul is referring to the man-made rules that try to protect the commands of the law. For example, the law says that a man should not do any work on the Sabbath, including lighting a fire. And so even to this day, Orthodox Jewish people do not drive their cars on Sabbath because to turn the key ignites the spark plug and technically lights a fire on the Sabbath. And so they don't drive their cars. Another example, the law says not to cook a, a baby goat in its own mother's milk. And so to this day, observant Jewish people do not mix meat products with dairy products in order to protect this commandment from the law. But these things are shadowy, man-made rules. But this was the same thing in Jesus' day, as we see in Mark chapter 7. Jesus replied to the Pharisees who were coming at him. He replied this, he said, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commandments of God, and you are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, 
You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. You nullify the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down. And you do many things like that. So that was even a problem in Jesus' day that he himself addressed. This focus on man-made rules. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And Jesus pointed us to the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Back in our passage, the Apostle Paul says that all such man-made regulations are destined to perish. This is because they are shadows. They are basic elements of this world. They're not of our new spiritual reality that's found only in Christ. And even today, we can easily get caught up in such rules. Holding on to things that are but the traditions of men. Following the do's and the don'ts that are not even found in Scripture. But when we gain the right perspective, that we have new life in Christ as children of God, and we have the deep desire for holy living that seeks the reality of Christ, not the shadows, then we will be able to view the rules that Scripture lays before us in the right light, and then it will be a joy to follow them. Because we understand that they are there for our own protection and well-being. And this is very similar to relationships in our families. If a father gives a rule and the child then follows the rule only for its own sake without understanding the love behind it, then you know what? That rule will become a, a burden and that child will not want to follow it. And he will break it very easily. However, if the child first comprehends the love that he or she has from their father, and that has this heartfelt desire arises in their hearts to please their father in everything. And then that rule that the father has given will no longer be any kind of burden, but it will be a joy. Paul says in verse 23 that these man-made rules may seem to be wise on the surface, may have an appearance of wisdom, but ultimately, they don't hold back the flesh. They don't actually restrain the sin, sin of the flesh and the temptations that come along with it. The only way to restrain the flesh is to put it to death by the Holy Spirit. With eyes focused on Christ alone. Because I am a child of God. This is very similar to what Paul says also in Romans chapter 8. He says there... Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. But it is not to the sinful nature or the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature or the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you receive the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Just as the Colossian believers were called to turn their eyes back to the glory of the Lord Jesus, because they had taken their eyes off him momentarily, as this false teacher had whispered in their ears. But now they're called to turn their eyes back to the glory of the Lord Jesus and find in Him the only reality worth pursuing. So we are called to do the very same thing day by day. Maybe we find ourselves having put Christ to the side. Maybe we find ourselves diminishing the glory of Christ in our lives. Or we're just going through the motions, following the rules because we think we have to. We've lost connection with the head, maybe. We're being filled or, or entangled with these shadowy things. Well, the answer is to put Christ back at the center. He's the reality. The only reality that's worth pursuing. 
We are called to put Christ as our main focus in life. To realize who we are in Him. Our identity in Christ that must come first. So that we are filled as children of God with a desire for holiness. And then out of that it is a joy to follow Him in obedience and trust. So if we find ourselves entangled within human traditions and man-made rules, we must take our eyes off of the shadows and fix them back on the reality, upon the one who is our head, from whom we grow spiritually, the one in whom we have new life. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your holy word. Father, it can be so easy to lose sight of Christ, to become disconnected or feel disconnected from our head and feel that, that ceasing of nourishment that, that comes from him alone. And so, Father, from our passage, we have this exhortation to fix our eyes back on the centrality of Christ so that we know who we are in him. So we may be filled with this, the desire of loving children, to love a holy God and to imitate his holiness. And out of that then, to put to death the misdeeds of the flesh. To put to death sin in our lives so that we can walk in victory over sin. So that we can walk in, in the light of Christ, worthy of the calling we've received, worthy of the gospel. And so, Father, if, if we are tired or overwhelmed or downtrodden or we are, find ourselves entangled in the shadows, Father, help us to check our hearts. Where is Christ in our view? Has he fallen to the side? Has he fallen out of our view when he should be in the center of it all? Father, convict our hearts today that if that is the case, we will spend time today not tomorrow, but today, reflecting upon the goodness of the gospel, the beauty of Christ, who he is, to put him back front and center, so that out of that, that he is the reality that we can cling to, then the reality of our identity in him will become clear to us once again, that we are children of yours, that we can call you Abba Father by the Spirit who dwells within us. And then out of that may our times of spiritual refreshing come. Father, I pray that you would be with each one who hears this message, that we would be convicted, Father, to take our eyes off of the shadowy things and to put them back on Christ who is the center. Father, all the glory goes to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.